Good morning, everyone. Uh, to the second day of our AGM 2020. Uh, this is the first seminar of, of, for the day. Uh, for those who have not met me or know me, I am um, Amir Sajad. Um, I am consultant psychiatrist and executive medical director for Navigo. Um, I have got privilege of being joined uh, by Dr. Shahid Latif. Uh, Dr. Latif is, uh, has got a very big profile uh, of his, uh, uh, his various roles and uh, positions he holds uh, at national level, at Royal College level. Uh, for the purpose of today's talk, to get Dr. Latif here to speak to uh, staff members and service users within Navigo is about uh, uh, the role he has got to play uh, as a chair of Transcultural Psychiatry Special Interest Group for Royal College of Psychiatrists. Just to remind that this year's AGM, our theme is cultural and diversity we are celebrating. The, the different cultures uh, that we have within the organization, uh, you might have heard a, a very impressive talk by Liam and Brighton yesterday on this, uh, on this very particular issue. Uh, and also we've got another presentation lined up today later on when um, Brighton will be presenting one of the cultural aspects uh, of, uh, of our staff group, and that is around Zimbabwe today. So without taking too much time, uh, I would like Dr. Latif to uh, please join us and first take us through what his, his, his different roles and how he has become a chair of this important special interest group in the college. Over to you, Dr. Latif. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malik, Amir, as I call you. <laughs> Um, for the uh, for the kind uh, introduction, um, yeah. What, what what I'll do is I'm I'm, I'm basically I'm a, a, a consultant psychiatrist and clinical director working in Northamptonshire, and um, I also chair, as Amir has highlighted, the transcultural special interest group. What I'll do in this presentation is just give a bit of a nose oversight as to the importance of culture, meaning, understanding, communication, and also give a bit of my journey as to why I developed an interest in culture and my journey becoming the chair of the transcultural special interest group and why I think it's important and what the college is doing and obviously also relating to that some of the work with which Amir will be chipping in as well in relation to Navigo and its role and its responsibilities and some of the work that it's been proactively doing like for example today's at the AGM and also the conference that's been arranged by Navigo Care. So uh, I think these are really, really important. And we'll touch on these over the next, um, over the next half an hour. If we go to my first slide, please, which I hope everyone can see an X-ray, um, an X-ray of what I would normally, have, obviously if I was, um, if I was in, a, in a conference or if I was in a classroom, I would actually ask one of the of the audience rather, I would ask him, what is this? But obviously we can't do that because um, although we are, we will be hopefully taking some Q and A's and some questions, but um, it'd be interesting. Uh, it's normally we get interesting responses. Now, as you can see, this is an X-ray of what seems like a abdomen with butterflies inside them. Now, we all know that uh, there is, uh, 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 we, we, there's, um, a phrase which we say that we talk about having butterflies in the stomach and we all know what that means we don't have to be a doctor or a psychiatrist or a nurse or any mental health or medical background to know what that it's a layman term when people feel that they're having they're, they're experiencing butterflies in the stomach now it may sound very simplistic but the reason why i've put this up is which i think starts off and kicks off why understanding culture language meaningful communication so so important and this is a real life experience when i started off as a very junior doctor in the republic of ireland um, where um, um, another um, a new a brand new sho senior house officer as we used to call them in those times now called core trainees um, started and was during the ward round presented a patient who had told the doctor that um, they had uh, they were experiencing butterflies in their stomach and without asking a lot of questions, the SHO thought that this patient was deluded because how can somebody have butterflies in their stomach? And he took it literally, which can sound like um, very concrete thought 
if you look at it rather than having understanding the abstract around it or the meaning around it or the culture around it or what that actually means for the culture. So the point of putting this up today as a first slide is I suppose to kick off and to understand why very, very basic things can be mis misunderstood, misperceived, uh, um, and basically you know, leading to a long, wrong conclusion, etc. Or if it's not a conclusion, uh, a, a wrong idea, not only for uh, professionals, but also for patients as well, if there is a lack of understanding of culture in between. If you go to my next slide, please, and hopefully on the slide, you can see three jars. Again, it's something very similar. These are obviously, as we can see, this is baby food. And this is basically looking at, um, I, I, I just Googled and looked at some incidences where marketing intelligence went seriously wrong. This was a ploy of, an, of a company called uh, Gerber, a German company who attempted to, in the 70s, um, uh, explore the market for business for baby food, and they got it totally wrong. I can't remember which, which African country it was, but what they actually did in that particular African country, what normally would happen is um, the whatever is present, and that's just the culture of the country, whatever is present inside, they put a, normally would put a picture of it on the front. So as you can see there on this jar, you actually see a baby. So for the people of that particular country, this would go absolutely wrong because what they think there would be inside is crushed baby or baby paste, which if you look at it from a, uh, from a um, business perspective, they just did not do their market intelligence, just didn't do it. Again, lack of understanding of the culture or norms of a particular culture. Similarly, I was just discussing and someone had told me that in the 60s, Pepsi Cola, their color, and now it is dark blue, it used to be light blue. And um, in the 60s, when they started off, they put a vending machine in Japan of a light blue vending machine of Pepsi Cola, and it just didn't work. And they were th couldn't think about why it didn't work and why people wouldn't buy it. And that's because light blue in the Japanese culture uh, denotes death. So, um, you know, individuals and Japanese being very superstitious people did not want to go anywhere near or be seen drinking Pepsi Cola out of a vending machine, which was light blue in color. And it only came to them later on. If you go to my next slide, please, this is another example of a hotel in Eastern Europe, um, something, a picture someone sent me, something that's called Bad Hotel. And, you know, you may have people staying in this hotel, but, you know, people from English speaking countries, they won't really want to start, stay in a hotel, which is called Bad Hotel. I mean, that would be, uh, you know, won't, starting, won't be starting off the right. So it's basically understanding if you are catering or trying to understand a certain culture or catering to certain people from different cultures, these kind of market intelligence and, and norms one has to be conscious of. And it's very similar for us in mental health to really, really understand our customers, our clients who are our patients and their carers and to understand where they come from. And if we don't understand or attempt to understand, then obviously we will miss something. To go to it's, my next it's, slide. it's really key, Dr. Latif, that we, we've got our own unique identities, we've got our unique cultures, or we need to have a norm where we should be able to understand each other and that would be stepping outside of our own beliefs, our own cultural values and to put into, into the perspective of where this person is coming from. And this is where we might be able to identify what their needs are. And that might also help us actually wrongly labeling people suffering from mental disorders if, because some of the strongly held beliefs might not actually be abnormal for, for the group of people that they live in. So absolutely, I, 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 I'm with you that we have to try to understand and come to some level of understanding that their differences might not be an abnormality. Absolutely right, Amir. And um, I'll come back to that actually, because this is something that um, was fed back to me in one of my presentations. One of my first presentation I did in relation to a, a, um, a survey that we conducted, qualitative research survey we did um, back about 15 years ago, but I'll come back and just to point out what you've actually said as to the feedback that I got was exactly what you said. My current slide is basically just highlighting um, the definition, what Oxford Dictionary says about what culture is. So this is the simplest definition I could find. There's lots of definitions. And it basically says that culture is ideas, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. So this is a very basic, um, if you like, um, Diagnosis. If you go to my next slide, please, um, which 
highlight, just says qualitative study, um, and go to my next slide. Now, this is really, really important, and I just want to highlight something that Amir, uh, Dr. Malik, has just highlighted, and I'll just to reiterate what he said, just after I've given you an understanding. This is something back in 2006 or seven, I think it was, when I was a... Um, when I started off as a senior trainee, SPRs, as we used to call them, now called ST4s to ST6s, so senior trainees. And um, I did a stint in a forensic media secure unit. And with my consultant, I used to visit uh, prisons in Leicester. And um, my, um, my supervising consultant um, came back to me and said, Shai, there's something I really want to ask you because he knew I was from an Asian background and also knew that I was from a Muslim background because of some of the discussions we had had. And he said, every time I see a Muslim patient, inevitably, they always say that something made them do it. Either it was the evil eye called Nazar or Seher or black magic, also known as Jadu in Hindi, Punjabi and, and, uh, uh, and uh, Urdu, um, or they were possessed by the jinn. What is this? He just could not understand what this phenomenon was. So in my limited understanding, I did try to attempt to explain to him what I had, but it gave me an opportunity. And that's where it really, really kicked off for me to understand, um, you know, what something that we take um, very simplistically as our understanding, you know, living in the West, there's a very a highly lack of understanding of these. So we are starting off at a totally different, uh, different um, levels. So we are not in sync as far as that communication or understanding is concerned. And especially thinking about in the Asian and the Eastern where uh, communities where mental health can be taken as being stigmatizing, it's very easy to focus on external locus of control as opposed to the internal locus of control, which actually would take individuals away from understanding their mental illness or their family's mental illness or their carers uh, understanding, you know, uh, their family members or relatives or friends' mental illness. Now, what we did was, um, to get a better understanding, we uh, formulated a, um, a semi-structured questionnaire, piloted it in a mosque, and um, we subsequently then distributed it out into the community. And the demographics we had on there, we had, uh, we asked questions like beliefs in these states, uh, whether they could cause physical or mental health, who should treat them, and any other comments. And it was really interesting because the number, I think we, would, we did quite well getting 111 um, uh, responses back. And the participants weren't just, uh, you know, uneducated, unemployed people. It was from various backgrounds. We had teachers, lawyers, psychiatrists, doctors, GPs, accountants, engineers, housewives, male and female, almost two equal numbers, employed, unemployed, those working in different areas around the country. And it was mostly, this was basically focusing on the Muslim population. And it was very interesting um, what we, there were some of the results which we got back. If we go to the next slide, please. And um, some of the things that people said, majority of the almost 100% said that they believed in these states. And the reason for these was because it's mentioned in the Islamic scripture. Um, and it's part of being a Muslim that they have to believe on that. But it depends on where they next take this. And as you know, a majority of individuals may who have a lack of understanding or do attach mental health to stigma would prefer to focus on these areas and go to faith healers and not access their GP or mental health professionals. Um, they would rather go to their imam which, or community leader or faith healers. And when, when we asked them why that would be, some of the things they mentioned was things like they would feel that they would not be understood, there would be a, a communication barrier, they could be seen as being superstitious. They could be seen as not being understood. And we did ask them also that what are the presentations that you one could present with if they are, you know, possessed or if they do, or if somebody does perform black magic on them or there's some evil eyes cast on them. And some of them spoke about what in our terms we term, we understand as somatic symptoms, you know, um, and also something which in the Western concept we call pseudo dementia. You know, um, and they said that some of these causes of these is due to black magic, is due to evil eye and possession states and the jinn. If some of you don't understand the jinn, jinn, are, jinn is an entity uh, which Muslims and other culture. I was just talking to one of my uh, the pastor this morning in our trust today because of another patient, and we were talking. And there's a lot of similarities. Um, 
begin believing in the entities of not only human beings being an entity, but there's the angels and the third entity being jinn. And these are part of the religious belief for Muslims, what they believe in. And for them, it's just the norm. Where they, where they then take these and how you utilize these is very variable. Sorry, Dr. Malik, I think you were about to say something. No, no, absolutely. I, I think being possessed, uh, reading the literature, I think, uh, uh, although in the third world country, especially in Southeast Asia, I think there's a lot of predominance. Uh, but I think the main issue is if people are not educated, they are not getting the right care and they actually get into the hands of quakes, as, as you said. Uh, that leads to more resistant treatment when it, it's delayed, as, as we know. So, uh, but yeah, being possessed, being possessed by a ghost or spirit or having a spell on, I think that's well established in, in the literature all, all around. Uh, but the thing is how to educate people to not actually take it that this is, this is gonna go away by actually getting a bit of meditation. It needs a proper care. Absolutely, and I, and I think it's really, really great, uh, Dr. Malik, that, you know, part of your AGM, you have included culture, and when you ask, say the question, how do we educate, this is one of the ways of doing it, you know, exactly. and this is absolutely, and I think we need to be doing more of this, um, you know, to different trusts, and I'm really grateful that Navigo Care has really taken this initiative to, you know, have, give the opportunity to share um, the understanding. Now, if you go to my next slide, these are some of the comments which came back. Uh, which talks about lack of understanding, why people thought that they would not want to access specialists. And as already highlighted, some of this, it could be due to lack of understanding. They could be seen um, as being superstitious or backward, or there would be a language barrier. So these are things which actually stop individuals from accessing mental health services. As we all know, and as Dr. Malik has highlighted, you know, if there is a delay in access, that means the condition, the underlying mental health condition can get worse. And we are all aware of the term DUP, duration of untreated psychosis. And the longer the duration, the more resistant it is to treatment. And, you know, patients do end up on clozapine because they are felt or seen as being resistive rather than being caught on time. Um, so these are some of the barriers and some of the comments which came back and some of the challenges that, are, that we face as specialists and professionals to really be conscious of. Now, I did present this paper um, as, and just going back to what Dr. Malik had said earlier on about you know us professionals being aware. I went back and presented this paper because I was an SPR at the time, or this is the outcome, to my SPR group. And there were about uh, 25 to 30 SPRs in the trust at the time. And they were just astonished by what I was saying. And the reason why, why they were astonished is because they had never thought of doing their consultations with patients to even even consider that when patients sitting on the other side of the table, when they're asking them these questions, especially when they're from different cultures, that what they are actually saying could have a totally different meaning to what the specialists is being is, is trying or attempting to understand from their own training, from a Western concept of mental health and you know the Western cultural understanding of mental health, but actually it, there's a bigger picture out there and a bigger understanding. Go to my next slide, please. And that's where we, we um, um, the, these factors, the next couple of slides, is really, really important. And I say the culture specific symptoms may lead to under recognition or misidentification of psych psychological distress. So, as you see, that some things may be seen as culturally specific, but misunderstood because the cultural distress may not be picked up. And if you go to my next slide, it could be the opposite as well, where somatic symptoms serve as cultural idioms of distress in many ethno-cultural groups. And if misinterpreted by the clinician, may lead to unnecessary diagnostic procedures or inappropriate treatment. What these two slides are actually saying is that number one, if we do not understand cultural norms, we may actually miss psychological dis underlying psychological distress. And converse to that, if we do not understand culture, we may unnecessarily, we could unnecessarily um, put somebody in a box and put them into a diagnostic kind of a um, area, which may not be necessary and unnecessarily treating them when we haven't understood where they are coming from. So there are two aspects. So these two reasons for these, um, these two slides are really, really important. If you don't take anything away today, please do take away these two slides because they're really, really important because not understanding is, I think, 
a complete lack of communication or meaning of communication. And I'm going to be keeping using, I'm going to keep using the word communication again and again, because that's what's really, really important. And it's meaningful, meaningful communication, which is really important here. That takes me on to my next slide and gives me the opportunity to um, introduce uh, the, um, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, uh, special interest groups. Now, subsequent to the interest that I developed in culture and mental health from 2006 onwards, I did become the treasurer when I heard about the transcultural special interest group and I was with them for a little while. Um, and then uh, about four or five years ago, I heard that um, uh, that uh, there was a chair position and actually I'm going to blow um, Dr. Malik's trumpet that he actually prompted me. Um, I can still remember he, uh, he, he sent me an email, Shahid, that there is um, a position and he knew my interest in culture and mental health and he said, there's a position you should actually apply. And I said, Amir, I've missed it. And I actually applied, it wasn't an election. And thank you to Amir's prompt. I actually uh, was elected as the chair and I will be the chair until the middle of next year. So thank you, Amir, for that. Again, Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Latif, and yeah, you brought me as executive into the group as well, so in return, so uh, yeah, I, I think I, I forgot to mention, I'm actually part of the executive committee uh, for Transcultural SIG. Uh, I know you, you are going to be talking about what SIG does, but yeah, um, I think it's, it's been a mutual understanding. We, we did think that there is a, there's, a, there's a lot that we can do for our organization, especially from Navigo. We are situated in a, in a part of the country which is predominantly uh, not having a lot of uh, uh, culturally diverse uh, population and the staff up until recently. But uh, from more recent figures, it does look like that uh, our staff number, possibly anything between nine to ten percent of our staff, are from ethnic uh, minorities, which I think is a major, major shift. And there's been a lot of the work that's been done by Navigo's overall staffing, overall community, and especially the senior leaders. Uh, like the uh, you know, like the chair and chief executive and director of operations to promote more ethnicity uh, ethnic diversity in the organization because we are actually seeing a lot more people moving into the area and we are actually coming across being able to kind of offer them treatment and care so for my me to step into that role and also for yourself i think it comes on the background that we all wanted that our different staff members as well as our service users get represented, have, have a voice at, at national level, and we should be able to educate back our local services how to possibly do best kind of care for them and also provide support to our own staff. Absolutely, um, I couldn't say any better, uh, Amir, it's, um, you're absolutely right. So the Royal College of Psychiatrists, they do have uh, different um, platforms, they have faculties, they have divisions, and they also have what we term as special interest groups. Um, at the moment, there are 15, 15, uh, 15 special interest groups. If you go to my next slide, you'll be able to go through and see these 15 special interest groups. Um, and, um, you know, starting from adult forensic, um, arts, evolutionary, history of psychiatry, new development, occupational philosophy, private independent, rainbow, uh, which is the LGBT groups, uh, spirituality, sports and exercise, the transcultural, women and mental health and volunteering and international. And, um, you know, um, when I did join the um, uh, transcultural, I can be proud and say, and I'll blow my own trumpet, that it, was, it, was, it wasn't a very active group at the time. So what we did was we brought on, uh, we brought on very active, proactive people like Amir onto the executive committee and a few others. There's about, uh, I think, 18 or 19 of us at the moment uh, on the executive committee. And we've done lots of work. And it is actually currently the leading special interest group in the college at the moment. It's very well intended. It's got the largest number of members who, who are signed up or registered with them. So they receive the newsletters, et cetera. And um, there's see, a lot of work. You, so would, would, would you please tell us who are the members in, in your group? Does, do they have to be policymakers or very high senior level people or is it, is it more diverse group? Because I think that would be really key for people who are listening to us. Yeah, if you go to my next slide, um, obviously it's the chair, which is myself. We've got a finance officer and both of us have been elected. These are the only two elected posts. The other are executive. We've got about 18 from various backgrounds and that's highlighted by, uh, by Amir. It's, um, actually, we, uh, we have people from all backgrounds. We've got doctors, uh, with psychiatrists who are consultants, who are junior trainees, who are, uh, who are senior trainees, ST4s, 5s and 6s. We've got an MTI um a member executive member we've got a physician associate 
uh, from Nigeria who has a very keen interest and who's just joined us about in the last uh, few uh, months, I think. It, um, um, so he, he's, he's going to be an active member and an asset for us. We've got um, uh, some professors from UCL. Uh, we've got some research workers. We've got nurses. Uh, we've got uh, medical students. Uh, we've got uh, nursing students as well. Um, so anyone who is interested, who's done some background work on culture and want to do some work going forward, and, and we brought them onto the executive committee. And um, I actually was, again, we were the first SIG, as we call it, the special interest group, who introduced non-psychiatrists or non-fellows or members or associate members of the college into the SIG. And other SIGs have now followed suit because it's really, really crucial that it's not just psychiatrists and doctors that we have on board. It's you know, individuals and professionals from different backgrounds who have done work, who are and are keen to do work with the, with the SIG, uh, with in relation to culture and mental health. So, so that's that's a, that's the background. That's what we have. It's normally a four-year term. I, like I said, my term is coming to an end uh, next June, and we will. And I will remain a proactive member because of my interest in cultural mental health, and as will as as will Dr. Malik. If you go to my next slide, please. Um, so, what is the role of the Transculture Special Interest Group. My next couple of slides will just touch on what we actually do and what we've been doing. Um, so the Transculture Special Interest Group supports policy and practice to improve the care of socially excluded and marginalized groups where culture is influential in the expression and management of mental distress. Now, some of the work we have done, you know, over the last three and a half odd years, we've had communication not only doing work for the college in influencing policy in relation to culture. And at the moment, it's really, really crucial. Um, we've um, con considering how important the BAME community and you know, the Black Lives Matters uh, slogan, how important it is. And you know, some of the incidences that we've seen uh, across, uh, across Europe and America um, and how wide diversity and equality, how important it's become. Um, we've also along with that also have had um, done some work with the with the home office where they have looked at some of the cultural and mental health issues which they manage and deal with in relation to immigration and some of the processes that use how they assess during the immigration process um, and they have utilized our expertise not only of psychiatrists but of nurses of psychologists etc um, and only recently we've been contacted by the department of health in relation to the Pre prevent program and we've got a meeting next week, which I'm um, hopefully will be attending as well, how we can offer them our advice, because it is by a lot of people being a very controversial program. And we would like to, it's an our opportunity to feed into that. And individuals like, you know, Amir and other specialists, nurses, doctors, occupational therapists, medical students to feed in, offer their advice. So is Amir, I think you were going to say something about that, weren't you? No, absolutely. I, I think this is, uh, my, my point was, uh, that we are actually looking at the care and uh, of excluded group as, as such. So I, I think uh, now uh, the world has changed and people are actually getting a lot more aware of different cultures and, 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 and needs. But beyond the culture, beyond just the care of our service users, there is a lot of policy related work, which I think is important. And as, as, you, as, as you mentioned, prevent, there was also something to do with uh, race and equality uh, stuff with, that happens at GMC. The medical Council also uh, uh, there have been quite a few diaspora leadership uh, groups which are uh, happening across uh, across the country uh, and my query was coming into uh, how could SIG or Navigo as part of that SIG can be part of those those projects. Absolutely Amir um, and you know having you as an exec member automatically brings Navigo into it and your contribution so far has been extremely valuable and um, and you know it will we will continue to do so and the work that we do obviously we will be gauging your expertise and advice as to what is it that you feel how navigo can be um, in how we can in increase that engagement and involve navigo in that process so having you as an exec member offers us that bridge going forward now i, I will come back to what you said earlier on some of the work that we've done in relation to the bame and the gmc just before doing that along with the college work the other thing that we have influenced and continue to influence if you go to my next slide please is in relation to work in teaching training and curriculum development for the college um, and this is to ensure that cultural competencies 
remain an essential component in the assessment of the clinical competencies of all psychiatrists. As we all know, there's a lot of work that's gone on at the moment and a lot of discussions that have taken place in, in, in relation to um, differential attainment. And it's been a discussion for a long time, a long, long time, where there is very clear evidence to suggest where individuals, even if their uh, English is very good, um, there has been differential attainment for non-white um, trainees. And this is something the work that colleges are done in, something that we, as long as, uh, as well as the equality and diversity group, uh, which we are working on at the moment with the college, and something if Navigo, if they do want to get involved with in the future, which I'll come to in a moment, something that can, they can get in, involved in. If you go to my next slide, please. Um, some of the most recent work that we've done is last October, we had the college celebrated the Black History Month. And um, as, as a transcultural group, we did get involved. I actually involved my my trust into that. We weren't in these unprecedented times, so we were able to celebrate it in person. So we had steel bands, we had music, we had culture, we had food, we had carers, we had service users, etc., who came to the fore um, from the black community. And it was absolutely fantastic. And this is something hopefully going forward we can do again. Last month was South Asian History Month. And unfortunately, we couldn't do the same, otherwise we would have done the same. But we did formulate through the college and through our SIG, and I was invited as one of the speakers to talk about the black, um, the South Asian history and the contribution of South Asians towards mental health in the United Kingdom. And it was very popular because we have individuals from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Nepal, Afghanistan, etc., coming forward. And big names and national names and international names have really, really contributed towards mental health, not only nationally, but internationally as well. So it was really, really uh, an interesting process. The other one is race and equality. Our current president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, Dr. Adrian James, has, has, has appointed a presidential lead for race and equality. Um, and they are going to be doing a lot of work. And I would actually urge Navigo Care to feed and develop links with them, because one of the things that I've actually asked them to do, because they will be collecting a lot of data, local data, but I've also would ask Navigo Care to link up with, uh, with, um, with the president of Royal College of Psychiatrists, uh, because he's taking a special interest and use this as one of his priorities. And if there's any data and work which Navigo Care have done already in relation to diversity and equality, I would actually pass that forward so that they can assist. We are doing the same from our trust. We've done a lot of work as far as our uh, diversity and equality committee have, uh, have, uh, are concerned, we've done a lot of, and I love a lot of data and we'll be feeding into that. Amri, you wanted to highlight something, I think. Uh, no, I, I think I, I might repeat what you've already said. Uh, uh, our uh, project on celebrating diversity and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, culture and diversity, which was launched at this AGM, has, uh, uh, I mean, it was very interesting uh, talk yesterday by Liam and Brighton. Um, it is not one off. It is like we are trying to be doing as as kind of uh, 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 every quarterly we'll be setting up some kind of activity capturing the culture which has happened or will be around the time of that that particular uh, event. Uh, maybe post COVID era, hopefully when it comes and hopefully it will be soon, we might be actually doing more in, in kind of more like road roadmap kind of shows. So we will be actually going along uh, different areas and try to enhance different cultures there. And it has to be all inclusive. It's not about only the minorities. It's also about all the cultures that will also include any local cultures as well. We have to highlight like Christmas time and, and all the events that happen. So we, we've got a very uh, kind of very busy uh, plan for the for, for full 12 months uh, that should be happening as part of this, uh, this project. And uh, uh, once I uh, we finished the AGM. I would, I would actually try kind of send some briefing to you, and might get Liam and Brighton to speak to yourself as well, because I, as I said to you, I would like this work to be actually going at more national level, and it will help us reciprocally to actually learn something and also impart some of the information or some knowledge we've got from our own experience. Absolutely, um, I mean that would be really, really helpful and crucial. So it's not just at the college level. Something else that I was going to say, something that Amir prompted me about, is the is we there is also a um, GMC uh, BME we used to call it, but now it's B uh, BAME GMC BAME Doctors Forum, which I'm a, a committee member of. Uh, and obviously, one of the reasons for that is uh, my involvement with culture and mental health through the Transcultural SIG. And um, you'd be pleased to hear that there are obviously there's about 18 of us on the committee, and um, we've actually 
um, influenced a document which is now out, and I would urge you all to read it. It's called Fair to Refer, Fair as in F-A-I-R, to refer, authored by um, Roger Klein, who some of you may be aware of. Um, now, we've actually been able to influence because putting, making sure that the right language is in there and the right things are highlighted. And it focuses on things like those from the non-Indigenous population, non-white population, the BAME community, it was very evident that they are referred more to institutions like the GMC as a complaint in high uh, proportions. And this forum actually initiated from the Bawa Gaba case, which most of you may be aware of, where there was a Nigerian doctor who was unfairly dismissed and suspended um, and taken off the register, which we fought very hard the diaspora groups fought hard against and got her reinstated, though she's still not working, but this is where it originated from. But I think we need to continue with this process that if there's any unfairness, um, we need to be talking about this and it's these forums which offers us the opportunity to do so. If you go to the next slide, these are some of the things that the Transcultural SIG has regularly been involved in. We've been involved in local events. I will consider what you are doing today is a local event, something that Amr being an exec member of the Transcultural Special Inter uh, Trust. So we are at the end of November going to do a joint, very similar uh, a conference, a half day conference, which um, I will share with Amr. You are most welcome to join in. It will be focusing on culture and mental health. We also have annual conferences. Like I said before, before my tenure, our average uh, attendance used to be 20 or 25 individuals. But hope, thank God our last three conferences have averaged anything between 85 to 110. Um, and one of um, our last conferences was um, in back in February, just before the lockdown. And we had 77, even when coronavirus was kicking off and people were fearing going out. So we were one of the last conferences and they've always been very, very successful. We've had fantastic keynote speakers um, locally and we're gonna have our next one in February, which hopefully Amri will share with you. Apart from that, we have our regular newsletters uh, quarterly newsletters, which keeps us uh, the college updated and it's shared with members of all the work that we've been doing throughout the year. We've got our next one coming up soon. We've done a lot of international work and we've developed a lot of international links in America, the Middle East, South Asia, etc. We've got a conference, a joint conference, uh, the SIG uh, with Maudsley Dubai in UAE coming up next month. And that is has been organized because of the work that we've done. So it's a joint conference between the Transcultural Special Interest Group and, and Maudsley, which they have in Dubai at the moment in United Arab Emirates. Again, Amir will be able to share the links if you would be keen to join with the dates, etc. If you go to my next slide, please. Um, we also did something, just to give you something that would prompt you something that we've done and things that we do, thinking out of the box, that during the COVID-19 situation, just to make sure that we are catering for every culture and making sure that communication is meaningful and also understanding different individuals from different backgrounds, we understand or people can understand how they can manage their mental health during the lockdown because there were a lot of issues and a lot of things coming out which were in English and we thought that we need to share this in different languages. So we share this in 21 different languages. You can go onto the Royal College website, go onto the Transcultural Special Interest Group and you can actually see these. So it's the same message with different individuals from different backgrounds. So I'm talking about Urdu, Hindi, Romanian, Russian, German, Italian, French, um, Cantonese, Mandarin, uh, Nigerian, etc. Um, so it's about 21 different languages there. Um, so this is something which was really, really picked up and received really well by the college, not only by the college, but also by BBC. And we've had a few interviews because they were more interested in how we, will ma how we managed to get all these resources together. But we always say that, you know, when you have a group like the Transculture Special Interest Group, that's our idea is to make sure that we have the resources. And, you know, you don't have to do complicated work. It's very simplistic work, which really is very, very meaningful and impactful. If you go to my next slide, please. This is something I've been discussing with Amir about, and I'm aware that's the work that Navigo Care does provide, and I see on your website as well. That is the importance that, you know, you believe collaborative work um, how important it is, the focus and the importance that Navigo Care sees in equality and diversity, evident as of today, and the lived experience of mental illness. And this is, again, really, really important. And again, some of the things which I, else I picked up, which really was really music to my ears, is understanding through meaningful communication. Amr, is there anything else that you to add on to being, you know, the medical director for Navigo Care on top of that? 
Uh, no, I, I mean, Navigo is, has been a wonderful place. Uh, uh, we, uh, we actually work on, uh, on, uh, on, on kind of the principle that we need to be doing the right thing. And that right thing, whether it's small or big, as long as it is something that has got support of our community and membership, which is made up of staff and, uh, and our local uh, service users and carers group, we would actually embark on to, to develop that service. So a lot of services we have developed purely based on that. And I think all of the stuff that you have said it resonates with quite a bit that we've already been doing. Uh, obviously, this is something which now has come to this, at this forum, at this level for the first time. But it, it was really giving me a lot of excitement kind of say that I think we are, we are quite uh, there uh, where, where, where you, you actually want a lot of people to be. And it's only like we have to now channel ourselves, our energy in the right way and try to actually get this uh, to yourself and, and to college level and also to the people beyond the borders of, of, of UK and try to help out other institutions uh, as, as in, uh, when needed. I've got a couple of questions come up through the talk, which I'll, uh, I'll save it towards end. But uh, Dr. Latif, I think it's been, it's been a very inspirational talk from your own journey of how you became the, uh, a, a very uh, active member of uh, transcultural uh, special interest group to becoming a chair and, and your vision going, going beyond your current role as, as chair as well. Um, if, uh, uh, if there's anything else that at your end you haven't got, I, I was just thinking about, uh, you, you mentioned some of the anecdotes uh, about different presentation that might be labeled as a, as a disorder or that might not be recognized because of the communication barrier. So I think that is really important. And, and from the trainees and doctors uh, who are actually possibly listening to this or might listen to this talk afterwards as a, as, as, as a, as a recorded video, there are quite a few cultural syndromes that we have read in the literature and we have come across uh, in, in our practice as well. Uh, so uh, kind of talking about uh, Lata and Amok and Susto, and there are quite a few, I mean, the, uh, but I think that what well, I, I, I'm trying to say here that we are not really insulated in that sense that we will not be coming across those because the, the people are actually moving around quite a bit. And as in Northeast Lincolnshire, we've got a lot of population are from ethnic minorities. I think it's really important for us to really understand all of those. I, I can talk of one of the anecdote myself that we had somebody that we, uh, th uh, we uh, through repeated clinical encounters, we thought possibly this person uh, needs some management for an affective disorder, possibly they are on the high side for spending more and more time with them. We did understand that culturally that was from a population where people would generally be a bit a uh, bit, bit loud or they would like to actually communicate in a way that might come across as not very norm for this population, but it is norm for them. So when talking to other family members, uh, it, it, does, it did transpire that, well, this is how the family makeup or, or the cultural backup is. So it's really key that we should we need to be understanding uh, different cultures. Um, just to kind of say in, within uh, uh, Navigo, we, uh, uh, we have done quite a, quite a few quite a bit of work, as I said to you earlier, that we have been doing things, but now it is coming to more forefront uh, because of different changes that has happened with, uh, 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 with COVID and uh, also with the Black Lives Matters and, uh, and similar other stuff. Uh, we have recently set up our BME network. Uh, we had a first, our first meeting uh, a couple of days back, uh, led by our chief executive, Jane Livington, and joined by our head of workforce, Richard, myself, and also by freedom. So we would actually like our staff members and at later stage also our community to be able to bring issues to us, uh, to myself, to freedom, to this network. We'll be doing a lot of more advertisement on how this network is going to be working, but this is going to be a fortnightly event that we'll be holding ourselves uh, to start with, but this will become a lot more streamlined. We are in early phase, but this is something that BME network would be aspiring to that we should be there everywhere and people should be able to bring, bring any issues they got uh, uh, to, to, to the forefront. Okay, I think I'm just mindful of time. Uh, I've got a couple of questions that have come up, Dr. Deep, if you want to take, and it's about your work and also about transcultural SIG. Um, the first one is, I, I think it's quite accepted. Uh, I, 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 I thought that this would be something which is very normal for Navigo. Uh, a question is, uh, in the SIG, do you have any representation from service users or carers group? Um, we have. Is it something at the college level? Does it happen? 
Um, at the college level, we always, when we do have conferences, etc., there is a separate forum where we do get, um, there are certain uh, picked number of individuals from a service user carer perspective. We don't have any on the executive, but actually that's got me thinking, and I don't think that's a bad idea. It has is something that we have been thinking about in the past, but I think this is something we would need to do going forward because um, getting that perspective would offer us an all-round perspective. Although we've got individuals from different backgrounds, professional backgrounds, I think that would be something to have on the SIG as execs would be really, really crucial. Having said that, obviously we've got, um, we have been involving in our, in our conferences, um, uh, patient and carers, um, but I think on exact level, we haven't done that as of yet and something that I think we wouldn't really need to seriously consider and think about. That's great. Thanks, Dr. Latif. And then a uh, question has uh, come from uh, the work you've done about, I think it was your study. Uh, so I'm going to read it out to you. Did anyone in this study happen um, to comment on whether their spiritual leaders were supportive in accessing them healthcare if they felt it was needed? Or did they often try to heal these within the faith? Um, it's really interesting. And that's a, it's a really fantastic million dollar question. Um, some of the things which we got back, I mean, there was a lot of sensible people. Just to just to give a background, that when we were conducting this survey, when I did say I did try to educate myself, myself and Tim, and me myself as well, we did go around and meet quite a number of Islamic scholars. We did go around meeting quite a few faith healers, and we did go around talking about a few community leaders to get just get. And there was a mixture. Um, there was a mixture. Some people or individuals felt that it's so, so important that we work in collaboration and that one is a right hand, the other one is a left hand, and we have to work together in order to assist uh, individuals who do experience mental health or spiritual problems. While they were to the other extreme where individuals felt, and I do remember a comment, one of a faith healer saying to me that, well, if you ever need a help, you can come to me because you need me, but I don't need you. <laughs> so, you know, so it's one ex and anything in between. So the, it is variable. What I would say is that um, we do tend to follow a very Western concept of mental health delivery of service, where we do follow the biopsychological social model of, 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 uh, of treatment protocols. Um, but I would urge, um, you know, you don't have to be religious to do this, but it's really important being professionals to understand the biopsychosocial, spiritual, cultural element of individual when we do embark and when we, talk, when we do talk about the social element, the culture is so important there. You know, spiritual is so important. For many people, it may be important. We shouldn't just assume that they are. That's, you know, that's wrong as well. But we shouldn't assume they are not either because, you know, a lot of people do benefit, do benefit from talking. And part of our, uh, what's something that we do in the college level and at local levels, at trust levels, we do talk about is social prescribing. And when we do talk about social prescribing, it's really important that we do bring the spiritual element to that. It's important. We are patients. I cover a rehabilitation ward in my trust. And, you know, at least a couple of patients are finding it very useful uh, with the input of the pasture and chaplaincy. They regularly meet them, and that's part of their treatment protocol. And without that, I think they would struggle, even with, you know, just the biopsychosocial approach. So I think it's really, really important that we have an all round holistic approach towards treatment. Thank you. Um, just looking at uh, uh, our uh, comms team, if they've got any further queries come up, uh, to my knowledge, that was the only thing that I was passed on to. Um, Christina or Bradley, if there's any other thing in, in your chat box or, all right. Okay. Well, on that, thank you so much, Dr. Lati, for giving us your precious time. I know you are in a very busy critical work as well at, in Northamptonshire. Um, I would formally once again like to invite you to come to Navigo. It's been a few years since you last visited us and uh, you would uh, uh, definitely see that uh, uh, where, where we were uh, a few years back, we've definitely developed a lot more than what already was there. And, uh, and, uh, and the compliment I received from your last visit were also quite enriching for, for us. Uh, I think at this time I would, uh, really welcome your, uh, your, your suggestion about getting a uh, service user or carers rep onto the exact group, because this is what Navigo's uh, ethos is. We actually want to like by, by the services. And I, I, think, I think this is really positive. Um, I, I 
think uh, uh, it's, it's a busy uh, schedule for, for, the, uh, for AGM. We've got another 10 minutes and for the next talk. And at the, this time, I don't think so. Without having any further question, we would like to close this talk. Dr. Latif, once again, thank you very much for your previous time. And uh, I hope to see you soon in some other talk at Navigo uh, as well. Uh, so uh, thank you again uh, for, for making this up available today. Thank you very much. And thank you to yourself and Navigo for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.